Hello and welcome to another UMass Boston Nantucket Field Station remote seminar. We are um, so thrilled today that you're joining us. Um, my name is Yvonne Ballancourt and I am the director of the Nantucket Field Station. Uh, we sit on 100 acres of conservation land owned by the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. The station itself is a facility of UMass Boston and uh, managed by the School for the Environment. Um, and we run classes and support researchers that come out and use our laboratory or stay here in our lodging. We collaborate with a variety of people, so you do not have to be a UMass researcher to um, be using our facility, although we do have very many people from the UMass system that do. Um, here on Nantucket, uh, we are familiar with algal blooms and unfortunately also now with PFAS being uh, in our water down by the airport. Um, so I was really excited to learn about Dr. Yang's work. Uh, joining us today, and I am so thrilled to introduce him, um, is Dr. Yang Yang. He's a professor at Clarkson University in Potsdam, New York. And he, uh, in his lab, do work to reduce um, algal blooms and um, contaminants like PFAS and other forever chemicals from water. Um, and I will let him tell you all about that, but I'm so thrilled. I find it very hopeful to hear about people who are working towards engineering uh, these things that we have to contend with. And certainly on Nantucket, we're very familiar with uh, being concerned about what is in our water and um, having some of these issues ourselves. So um, without any further ado, I uh, would uh, hand this over as uh, Dr. Yang um, shares his slides with us. You can go ahead and do that um, and he'll take over. All right, hello everyone. Um, nice to meet you virtually and it's my great pleasure um, to have this chance to present uh, our latest research so my name is Yang. Um, I am a assistant professor at Clarkson University. So I start my lab uh, in 2019. Uh, before that, I was a, a research scientist at uh, California Institute of Technology, Caltech. So this talk will sort of uh, cover both my uh, re part of my research at Caltech and my ongoing research at Clarkson. And I'm still collaborating with the Caltech team uh, for, uh, for the disinfection project, which I will show you later. So um, there will be a lot of uh, unpublished data. So because we are a new group um, and I believe that showing this unpublished data give me and my GLAM member a continuous motivation to get things done, publish it earlier. So um, let's hit the roll. So um, today we are actually going to talk about using electrochemical oxidation as a efficient method to mitigate, to address various environmental um, challenge. So this figure is my personal opinion, right? Um, the conclusion may change case by case. So I, in my opinion, um, there are a lot of available um, uh, biotic, uh, bi uh, biological and about a biotic uh, treatment process that can um, address the water challenge we are facing. So um, depends on how dirty or how concentrated the water could be. Uh, we have this chart uh, laid out as a function of the operational cost and capital cost. So uh, biological treatment obviously is the, is the um, uh, most affordable one. Um, it can handle a, a very dirty water. So they, uh, the microorganism use the organic and inorganic contaminant as their food. Right? So while on, the, on this part of the chart, we know that UV disinfection is very, uh, is very efficient, you know, um, for the treatment of, uh, usually this will be served as a polishing step after the secondary treatment process. So um, it cannot work in a very dirty water because the coexistent component will probably reduce the UV transmittance, right? So 
in between, there's a chemical uh, process. That means you, um, you need to add oxidants to the water. So that would increase the operational cost. While here we have electrochemical oxidation process as an emerging, uh, uh, emerging technology, it can treat relatively concentrated stream and it is a chemical free process. So the capital, capital cost may lies in the electromaterial. It used to be expensive, but I think our group makes certain contribution to lower the cost. And this will be the ongoing quest for, for our future study. Um, because it is a chemical free process, so the operational cost is relatively low. Uh, all you need to do is to uh, apply a direct current uh, uh, using grid power or solar panel uh, to the system. Again, this is my personal opinion. So I believe um, electrochemical oxidation is a promising method. Um, therefore, I choose my, um, I bet my uh, career path on this technology. So before we go any further, let's do a little bit intro of electrochemistry. So when we talk about electrochemical process, that means we need a, a reactor to hold the water. You can use a beaker. Um, there will be anode and castle uh, showing here, anode and castle. So the electro array will be driven by DC power supply um, using a DC current. So once you apply the electricity, the electron will be withdrawn from the anode and transferred to castle. So at the castle, usually a uh, water a proton in the solution will receive this electron to produce hydrogen. So there's a, a very hot area um, using a cathodic reaction to produce hydrogen as a clean energy resource. We did find that if we use the hydrogen produced uh, during the electrochemical oxidation process, the hydrogen energy can partially offset the overall energy cost. But today we're actually going to talk about a lot of things happening um, at the anodes. So at the anode, what would happen? Uh, we know that if something lose one electron, that means it's an oxidation reaction, right? So if you look at this chart here, um, depending on the uh, voltage apply onto the anode, um, if you have a, if you, the voltage hits certain thermodynamic criteria, which is the reduction potential, then you have a chance to produce this compound. For example, if you apply another potential of 1.23 volt or even higher, you will see oxygen bubble evolving, right? So if you go higher, uh, um, incre further increase the voltage to 1.36 volt, you can oxidize chloride in water to chlorine, which is a very useful disinfectant. Uh, I, will be I, will, I, I will address this in the following slides. So, with the increase of the anodic potential, for example, 2.7, you will be able to produce hydroxyl radical known as the most powerful oxidant um, you can find in water. Um, there's another group of reaction that is called direct electron transfer. That means the, um, or, um, the contaminants will be directly absorbed by the anode and after that, one or several electrons will be forced to transfer from the organic to the anode. Uh, the, uh, with that say, um, the contaminant will be directly decomposed by the anode rather than all these reactive species indirectly produced from water. So here is the intro. And in the following, let's say, 30 minutes, I will introduce three projects using these principles to address real environmental challenge. So the project one is called, I name it electrochemical toilet. Um, why we are going to talk about toilet. So toilet actually is the greatest, uh, one of the greatest invention uh, in modern era uh, because it serves as a barrier isolating human being from the waste we produce, right? So um, it is a barrier that efficiently uh, block the transmission of disease. So in a lot of developing country, a rural area, uh, open defecation is a big problem because imagine that, uh, look, just look at this picture. So if, open, if someone practice open defec uh, defecation, um, the runoff or any uh, 
well, probably a runoff will bring the pathogen from the specifics at the nearby sites to this drinking water resource. So a study published by WHO shows that um, if, we, if we have less chance to access clean water, then we will have a lower life expectation, right? So human, uh, human feces and human excretion contain various contaminants and parasites. It can cause disease, no doubt. So you might think that, okay, we are living in a modern city with um, um, a modern sewage system where things can go wrong, right? I think the um, recent COVID situation taught us a lesson. So uh, toilet still is a critical component even in the built environments. So there's a very interesting article published uh, recently showing that if you flush the toilet and or you um, and um, or you aerate a tank um, in the wastewater, you will have a chance to create this bioaerosol. So this study shows that although it is less likely that Ebola virus will be trans uh, will be tr transmitted through these aerosol uh, produced by flushing toilets, but we cannot ex exclude the possibility. So this year, well, thanks to the COVID, I'm doing this Zoom presentation now, otherwise I will visit Boston, right? So, um, but let's talk about COVID. So if you Google the Amoy um, Garden, um, you will know that this is a, a, a terrible story um, happening in 2003 where the SARS happened um, in Hong Kong. So. Uh, a study showing that, well, if there's one super spreader uh, living one living room, um, the virus can be transmitted so that the whole the residents in the whole building gets affected. So, if you flush the toilet, the to the to the aerosol produced can travel uh, upstairs, and the sewage can travel downstairs, so that nobody can escape in this building. Um, so a very recent paper published this year uh, showing that in a long vacant 16th uh, floor apartment, uh, there's nobody, no one living before, uh, living before um, uh, somehow people found the RNA of SARS-CoV-2. So this, they suspect that this is because the bioaerosol transmitted uh, um, from downstairs. So another transmission um, experiment shows that if you flush the, your toilet at, at the 15th floor, um, the aerosol can actually travel 10 floors higher. So in the built environment, we also uh, need a technology that can make sure that every flush, um, after uh, every flush we made is safe. That means we need a rapid um, disinfection technology to enable the um, in situ curbing or in situ inactivation of the virus in the toilet wastewater. So um, I was a, a key member of the uh, project team at Caltech. Um, we developed a um, technology called solar toilet. So this is a typical, uh, this is a layout, um, the toilet wastewater will be transferred to an electrochemical reactor. Uh, this electrochemical reactor can be driven by solar panel or fuel cell. Um, th there will be a rapid disinfection reaction happening here. After that, the water can be saved for another, uh, uh, for internal reuse for another round of toilet flushing. So um, here's the picture. This is the real a mixture of number one and number two. Um, the wires you see here, um, our cables provide DC current to a set of electro arrays. After certain minute, <clears throat> after certain retention time, you will see this uh, brownish wastewater uh, turns clean. But actually the disinfection we already achieved before the uh, water gets clean um, um, eventually like becomes uh, transparent. So what really happened here, um, you can find in this figure, 
So at the anode, uh, we, uh, chloride in the uh, wastewater will be oxidized to chlorine. So uh, speaking of chlorine, uh, this is the major compon component in a bottle of Clorox you bought from Walmart. So this would be, with, with that say, we are producing Clorox uh, right in the toilet wastewater. So the chlorine produced will be, will kill the, you will readily inactivate the pathogen uh, such as E. coli and virus. The, chlor uh, the chlorine produced will also um, destroy organics, uh, resulting in the overall reduction of COD. It can also react with ammonia through the breakpoint chlorination pathway. Ammonia will be completely converted to nitrogen. So this will be a chemical um, denitrification process. Um, in the following days, we uh, create a company. Uh, so this would, these are the prototype, actual prototype uh, with the treatment capacity of 300 cubic meter per day. Um, so this, this is the reactor look like, and this will be, uh, this is the transparent version of the reactor so that you can see the nice actual uh, inside. Okay, so there will be anode and castle. So they stack in a sandwich configuration to enhance the contact area. Uh, of the to enhance the contact between the electro and the uh, wastewater. Okay, so we also start another company producing electro. Uh, we develop in the lab. So these are the electro product, and this picture showing me uh, holding a holding electro. So um, it can be the electro uh, product can be pretty big. So um, we ha we have the capability to do that. More picture about the actual products. So these are products deployed in tourism sites. Um, they, uh, the toilet and the electrochemical reactor are all assembled in the one shipping container to gain extra you know, mobility and flexibility. So at the front panel here, this is a normal toilet where I'm sitting on it. So on the back, back, part, back portion of this shipping container, uh, there will be the electrochemical reactor I showed you in the previous slides. So these are the previous projects um, and it definitely gained us a lot of uh, attention and attract a lot of the uh, collaborator, a, a lot of opportunity for collaboration. So uh, if you're interested, you can check this nice paper describing all the story and there's um, if you, um, if you subscribe Netflix, yeah, this will be a very interesting documentary you can look at inside Bill's, inside Bill's brain. So in the first episode, Bill will talk about the, a, um, the toilet project and we are within the camera. So we are, we are inside the field. Um, these are some, so today, today's talk, I won't include too many serious signs. So um, if you're really interested in um, the well, R&D part of this project, here are some paper you can take a look. Uh, in general, um, my job was to reduce the cost of electro. So here are the different version of the electro. So we, we gradually eliminate the expensive component in the electro and make it more efficient for the production of these oxidants. So yeah, it's, um, uh, it takes uh, several years for us to get that. Now in my group, I'm still, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that I still have the opportunity to collaborate with the Caltech team. Um, so the reason advance we develop, uh, um, as a reason advance, we develop a new electro that is able to produce um, ozone in addition to the production of hydroxyl radical and chlorine. So, as we can see, ozone has a lot. Uh, ozone can easily dissolve in water, and um, this so it has a very fast in uh, disinfection kinetics, um, uh, which comparable to chlorine. So with this extra input, um, this electrode can rapidly uh, make the water saturated with ozone. Uh, see the blue line here, and our previous study using electrode that heavily rely on chlorine disinfection, achieve disinfection about um, one hour. 
uh, with our latest invention, we, we, are, we are excited to see that the uh, six log removal of both E. coli, a surrogate of bacteria, and MS2, a surrogate of virus, uh, can, they can be readily inactivated within uh, 15 seconds. So uh, we are very exciting uh, to push this, this direction forward and eventually make this electro commercialized. This is one third of my talk. So, um, and the second project, ongoing project in my lab, um, we are working on the using the electrochemical oxidation method to mitigate the harmful algal bloom. So, <clears throat> you probably already witnessed uh, harmful algal bloom. Um, it is definitely not pleasant. Uh, fortunately, it only happened in summer. So uh, in summer with uh, enough nutrient inputs, uh, the input usually comes from agricultural source, non-point non source and uh, probably a runoff is also another important uh, uh, non-point source. At a appropriate temperature, usually in the summer with abundant light irradiation, you can have the algae, uh, algal bloom. <clears throat> it occur really uh, rapidly, so um, the biomass produced by the uh, algal bloom is quite um, um, quite stunning. You will, see, um, if you travel to any site, you will see that the the uh, the, the whole pond, uh, the whole lake uh, looks like a green tea. Uh, you can see the particle floating around, so that's horrible. Um, all these abundant uh, microorganism can greatly reduce the dissolved oxygen. Uh, concentration in water. Um, so that, uh, that kills other fish and other living species in the lake. Aside from that, when the alga, when the algae uh, is facing a stress, for example, overpopulation or lack of enough nutrient for them to grow further, they will be very unhappy. They will be annoyed. When they are annoyed, they will create a chemical, a group of chemical called cytotoxins. So these chemical, um, um, these are toxins. So a recent report just happened several months ago um, this year, um, saying that elephants in um, Africa were killed by these uh, alga, uh, these uh, cyanotoxins. So these are very toxic, to uh, um, toxic chemical. So if you walk the dog, around a lake full of algae, um, my suggestion is get the dog out of the water. Otherwise, if the dog get wet by the contaminated lake water and they leak, um, they try to get themselves wet, um, they, there's a higher chance that they, have, they will intake these cyanotoxins. Um, it is lethal. Okay, New York State is facing uh, this problem and it is sad that I hear from uh, Yvonne that uh, Boston is facing the same problem. So we have algal bloom uh, happening in surface water, fresh water in the upstate New York, and also uh, in seawater um, um, in Long Island. So we have around nearly 1,000 blooms since 2012. So um, we definitely want to uh, combat this uh, environmental challenge. So recently, the um, Governor Cuomo announced that we need to start a fight uh, to control the harmful algal bloom. Um, 82 million has been investigated to improve the uh, water quality uh, over uh, in the New York State. Um, so thanks to the collaboration between the uh, Center of Excellence and the New York State, um, NYDEC, we have the opportunity to develop um, electrochemical process uh, and make our contribution to mitigate harmful algal bloom in New York State. So the idea we propose is a electrochemical oxidation filtration process. We design a electro um, that can that combine well electro and filter together. So this material contains a lot of porous structure. We envision that when the water passes through, contaminated water passes through this microporous, the algae will be instantly e exposed 
to various oxidants produce electrochemically. Um, within very short contact time, right after they leave these pores, they will be inactivated. So we have um, small um, electro sample for bench scale study. We also uh, manufacture full size electro uh, for real, uh, for um, field application, which I will show. Uh, we, I, I will introduce in the following slides. But first of all, we need to verify the uh, the feasibility of this method in our lab. So we cultivate algae. Um, so we start this project in winter, though, so there's no way we can find algae in, in upstate New York. So there we, uh, therefore we purchase uh, algae sample and cultivate it in our lab. And we also is establish method covering the analysis of our chlorophyll A, which is a um, index of the algae abundance uh, or algae concentration. Uh, we establish a lot of chromo uh, chromatographic method to analyze mycocysteines uh, and algae toxins, um, disinfection byproduct, and, uh, and ionic uh, um, components in water. Okay, so we have an electro and it is porous. It is very important for us to study the electro property itself. So for any porous material, you can use a tape to measure the geometric area, right? But it is not, uh, very challenging for you to use a tape to measure the surface, the pore size area, right? So we, we use a method called um, um, cyclic voltammetry to, def to measure the capacitance of the electro. Um, and then eventually through a standardized procedure, we obtain the um, active surface area that can actually contribute to electrochemical reaction. So in our case, the geometric area you see from uh, um, the geometric area you, actually, you see from your eye is around 100 centimeter, but actually the reactive area is way larger than that. It's about 300, uh, three times larger um, as 300 uh, centimeter. Um, so we know that the electro will provide us a very large surface area at a lower footprint. So that's advantage one. Um, the second advantage is that we can force the water to flow through the electro. So we found a linear semi sort of linear equation, uh, linear relationship between the flow rate and the mass transfer coefficient. So with the increase of the flow rate, the mass transfer coefficient can be increased almost 10, uh, almost um, um, 100 times. With that say, a higher mass transfer uh, coefficient means a better chance for the oxygen produced by the electrode to, in to encounter the uh, target uh, react uh, pollutants faster. So, for a, we can also use the mass transfer coefficient to calculate the thickness of the diffusion layer. Uh, imagine if there's no stir at all in our system, no pump initiated, no flow, zero flow rate, the diffusion layer can be as thick as 500 micron. Once you initiate a convective flow by pumping the water, the diffusion layer can be reduced almost uh, 50 times. So that's a significant enhance in terms of mass transfer, securing a rapid um, disinfection, uh, rapid killing of the algae. So um, in the next step, we pick some uh, lake water, spike it uh, with the algae cultivated in the lab. After five minute electrolysis, we, sh we observe a complete inactivation of the algae and, and, a vi and a significant improvement in terms of the visibility of the water. So we also calculate the energy consumption. Uh, I, uh, we found that it is uh, absolutely feasible to be applied in the field. The energy consumption is about 0.4 kilowatt hour cubic meter. That gives us confidence to move forward. We also, we also done some uh, mechanistic study. Um, so algae was spiking water in uh, spiking phosphate buffer solution without any chloride. 
uh, which, uh, so as you can see in the purple line, there's a very slow inactivation of the algae, meaning that without chloride, the inactivation of algae by hydroxyl radical is negligible. Well, if we add one millimole of chloride, we will see the degradation or the inactivation kinetic was greatly accelerated. And one millimolar is a typical chloride concentration we can find in the lake. Of course, with the increased um, chloride concentration, an even faster um, inactivation can be achieved. So there will be twofold implication. Number one, we know that if there's chloride, uh, we can utilize the chloride to produce chlorine to fat enable, enabling the fast inactivation of the algae. Implication number two, we know that the system actually works very well if, you have, if the water contains a lot of chloride. That means, well, in this project, we just use it for lake water have mitigation, but if there's a, uh, we, uh, I put a hundred dollar bet on, on uh, that, our system will work even better uh, in, in uh, the mitigation of HAB in seawater. So, um, as for the destruction of cyanotoxin, microcystine LR, we found the same conclusion. Without chloride, the destruction reaction is relatively slow, while the presence of chloride greatly accelerates the decomposition of the cyanotoxin. With that said, electrochemical oxidation can effectively address two challenges, harmful algal bloom and microcystine simultaneously. So um, you might wonder, since we are relying on chlorine to kill the algae, so what would, what's the difference if I just pour a, pour a bottle of Chlorex to the water, right? So uh, we have, uh, then, then in this case, I'm still using chlorine. Then I don't need to get the, uh, I don't need to deploy a electrochemical reactor. Our finding is that electro, chemical oxidation um, um, method is way efficient than the chemical addition method. As you can see here, using an electrochemical oxidation and filtration method, we achieve a rapid um, algae inactivation um, at five minutes where only 2.5 milligram of free chlorine was detected. So if you use homogeneous, uh, homogeneous process by adding chlorine to the water, you will need 10 milligram per liter of free chlorine to barely, uh, to uh, and this degradation, uh, degradation kinetics, inactivation kinetics is still slower compared to the electrochemical oxidation process. With that say, using electrochemical process, we can achieve a faster inactivation at a lower chlorine dose. Uh, compared to a chemical reaction, a chemical addition. Uh, we also want to address the, the problem of the disinfection, uh, the formation of disinfection byproduct if we use chlorine as an uh, oxidant. So here is the chart showing that uh, if we operate it at a high current mode, the, uh, uh, chloroform will will, won't be a problem. So there will be only 0 0.08 of chloroform uh, produce, uh, which is far lower than, way lower than the EPA regulation of 80 microgram per liter. While the formation of H a haloacetic acid uh, like MCAA and DCAA could probably be a problem because we are, we are exceeding, slightly exceeding the uh, threshold uh, alert, about 60 microgram per liter. But uh, if we lower the current uh, density, then all these HAA and THM are way lower than the EPA regula regulation uh, value. So that gives us a confidence that, okay, we can actually use this compound, uh, uh, use this technology to, uh, to treat real lake water without causing secondary pollutant pollution. Okay, so um, we propose that electrochemical oxidation can achieve faster inactivation at a lower chlorine dosage. And we propose a new theory. Uh, we name it electrochemical locally enhanced chlorination. 
So if you look at the surface of the, our porous electrode, you will find a, a lot of slip, flow, a slip uh, pore here. So we propose that when the water passes through this narrow pore, um, that, uh, within this narrow pore, chlorine will be uh, instantly generated. And because um, we know that the concentration is a term of mass over, is a ratio between mass and volume, right? So if you produce chlorine at a constant mass rate, uh, but all this produced chlorine uh, was initially trapped in a finite volume, then that means there will be a regionally high con chlorine concentration. And that, that's the reason we can achieve a fast inactivation of algae cell. So let's move forward. Um, we are confident that this one, the lab, that the promising lab result give us confidence to further scale up the system. We made a larger electro, a larger tank, and we made, we, um, our project team is very creative. So we design a, um, we integrate all the power supply control module, pump module into Pelican box so that we can, uh, let's, we can, uh, uh, we can just uh, take, take these boxes to any, um, anywhere we want, any, any place we want. So here's a picture of the pilot scale demonstration in uh, uh, happening in this year, July, 2020. Um, thanks to NYDEC, we had the water collect, uh, have contaminated water from Lake near Toronto, and then we pumped the water to this, re to this tank uh, to do the pilot testing. The testing goes very well as expected. So we test different inlet concentration, algae concentration. Um, um, instant Q of algae was achieved at a retention time of 10 minutes. And the algae sample was further culti cultivated for extra uh, 48 hours. And there's no sign of regrowth. That means um, this, after entering this reactor, the algae will have a one-way ticket. So um, they will be killed instantly. So uh, we also observe a um, very nice uh, instant improvement in terms of with, um, um, visual improvement of the water, lake water. So. As for microcystines, we also see a reduction of the microcystine. I'm sorry that there's a singular point here, but it is, it is what it is. We don't know what happened. Overall, um, all the microcystine gone um, and there's no regrowth or re-increase of the microcystine concentration in the post-treatment area. Um, moving forward, we bought a boat and install all these equipment onto a boat and then uh, test the uh, uh, performance of the whole reactor in Lake Near Tawanta in upstate New York. So this all happened in just several months ago. Okay, here's some picture. So uh, we immerse this large electro rack into the lake water and the electro rack was supported by buoy so that they can be self-standing inside the lake water. Uh, and we move a lot of this pump box and control box on the boat. So uh, the, the control box provide electricity to drive the electrochemical oxidation reaction while the pump box suck the water out through this green pipeline. And then after treatment, uh, the water will be discharged uh, back to the lake. So here are more picture. Um, side view of the electro and the electro floating uh, on the, on the, uh, in the lake water. Uh, we are still analyzing the data sending back from uh, NYDEC. So um, here are some picture. We can achieve instant kill of algae. The, uh, the filter shows that, <clears throat> well, before treatment, there's a lot of algae, there, there, there were a lot of algae retained on the, on the membrane. After treatment, you will get a, a less greenish uh, membrane, indicate the effective inactivation of the cell. So here are two bottles of water. The left one is the inlet, right one is the outlet. So you will see, a, uh, as you can see, there's an instant improvement of the water quality. We also found that the treatment capacity um, is, um, as a function of the removal efficiency, 
So the low, lower treatment capacity indicates a longer residence time in our system. Uh, consequently, we, have, we can achieve a higher removal of the algae. But keep in mind that we are using one boat. So for, for example, if I want to remove 50% of the algae at a treatment capacity of uh, 100 uh, cubic meter per day, uh, we use one boat. Um, thanks to the modulized design of electrochemical reactor, if I want to gain a higher or larger treatment capacity, I will simply deploy more prototype or more boats to the lake to achieve that goal. So it seems like it is a feasible technology and we are working on further commercialize this technique to really you know, make our contribution uh, to, the, to the states and nationwide. So, um, in the, so I, this will be the last project I'm going to cover. Uh, we also work on PFAS. It is such a hot topic uh, now, nowadays. So this is the paper we published last year. So uh, it's describing all this uh, work. We talk about PFAS. Uh, PFAS is a um, nickname for poly, uh, per and polyfluoroalkyl substance. So there, uh, if, you, if we talk about fluoro, that means there will be a lot of fluorine in this, in this molecular structure. Alkyl means there will be a lot of carbon chain. Um, and the reason we use substance is that the functional hack group here can be replaced by a lot of stuff. So um, in this case, I'm so showing you the structure of PFOS. Um, S here represents the sulfonate group, and this one can actually be replaced by uh, carboxylate group, amine group, um, et cetera. So the number of fluorine can be varied. So if the, all the carbon is, uh, all the hydrogen on the carbon lens uh, is re uh, are replaced by uh, fluorine, then we call it PER, perfluorinated. Um, if some, some part are missing, um, yes, there, uh, we're uh, leaving some dangling oxygen here, then we call it poly, um, polyfluorinated um, alkyl substances. So these are PFAS, are a group of chemical widely used in various um, scenarios. It can be used for um, uh, closing, uh, coating, um, nonstick cookware, and even firefighting forms. So for more information, uh, I recommend you watch this nice movie uh, casted by Mark Ruffalo, um, mm. Dark Waters. So very nice movie, provide you more information about how this compound produce and how they enter our environment. Okay, obviously this is very important uh, chemical and people call it a chemical forever because it is very stable. Um, that's actually the reason why they use it as a, a very stable coating, right? So it is very stable and it barely react with various oxidants. So hydroxyl radical, they barely react with PFAS. So with, uh, that means if we, we, if we want to use a electrochemical oxidation to address this challenge, then, we, uh, then the indirect pathway won't work. So we have an idea using the direct electron transfer. That means we apply the potential of the electron at, a, at a, a potential even higher than uh, the OH radical. In this case, um, the PFAS can transfer one electron to electron leaving a radical, PFAS radical, and this radical is very unstable, it will be subjected to a series of self-destruction process eventually become CO2 and fluoride. Um, in this case, there's another problem. So if we apply a very high amount of potential, chloride will, always, will also be oxidized to perchlorate, which is a, a, a disinfection a byproduct. So the invention we made is that we found that the addition of hydrogen peroxide can eliminate the, can interrupt the oxidation of chloride to perchlorate, uh, leading to the co-reduction of perchlorate and PFO, uh, PFAS. So um, we can achieve a rapid PFOS, PFOA 
destruction within two hours. And using this strategy, we can inhibit perchlorate formation uh, significantly. Just compare the blue line versus the um, uh, versus the brown line. So uh, we always want to use this technique to address real environmental challenge. So the first thing we want, the first substrate we we tested is groundwater. So the groundwater was collected in upstate New York. Uh, fortunately, no PFAS were found in the groundwater, so we spike a lot, a, a, a little bit amount of PFAS into the groundwater for research purpose. So not spike into the well, but spike into a beaker. Okay, so here's some example. Um, here are some data. Uh, we can achieve a one log removal of PFOA and PFOS within one hour, and using the hydrogen peroxide. Uh, strategy, a city elect electrolysis strategy, we can achieve an overall reduction of perchlorate significantly. So very recently, we are working on the treatment of landfill leachate, um, which is another sink of PFAS. Um, and we, are, we, we have developing the flow through reactor for this purpose. And we, have, we also observe, we also obtain a lot of promising results. Um, uh, we can, this electrochemical oxidation technology can readily destroy PFAS at various chain lengths. And it is also functional for the removal of PFAS precursor. Um, we are still working on it, obviously. Okay, um, take home message. We talk about um, electrochemical, the principle of electrochemistry, and we know that electrochemical oxidation is effective for falling substrates. Uh, um, uh, subject, subject uh, disinfection, mitigation of harmful algal bloom, and PFAS elimination. So I want you to remember, I, I, I sort of, I want to do some uh, inception. So I want to, I want, I want to um, remind you that the beauty of P, uh, electrochemical oxidation is that um, this technique can enable the fast degradation of multiple pollutants. It does not require the addition of any chemical. It is modular, this, it, 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 uh, the design is modular. So if you want a larger treatment volume, you simply employ more electro, larger reactor. So it can be highly mobile. Um, everything can be in integrated into a pelican box and ready to go. Um, with that, I want to um, thanks. I, I would want to send a lot of big, uh, big thanks uh, to the team member and to the Clarkson team uh, a lot of faculty member uh, deeply involved in this project. And I also uh, want to acknowledge my uh, collaborator um, at Caltech and UC Riverside. And lastly, I want to um, uh, thank the general support from Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation for the disinfection project, and NYDEC for the harmful algal bloom project, and the Environmental Research and Education Foundation for the PFAS project. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's really interesting. Are there any hazards that you had to engineer um, or have concerns about? So what is, there's always, you know, something you have to consider if you're um, disinfecting do you, and, and what's the lifespan of something like that, of, an, of your self-disinfecting toilet? So um, disinfection is obviously um, very important. So we want to achieve a fast disinfection uh, um, and avoiding a... Uh, avoiding the formation of too much disinfection byproduct, right? So there's, a, there's always... A, um, this battle, you know. Um, so we actually, we, we did, when we do the disinfection test, we, all, we not only analyze a, uh, we not only analyze the um, microorganism, uh, we also analyze, we also pay attention to the control of disinfection byproduct. So we have published several paper focusing on that strategy and I'm confident that uh, we get that handle. So there are various strategy to uh, balance uh, these two aspects. Um, one thing I do want to comment is that the 
concern of disinfection byproduct actually um, applies to drinking water. So you're not going to drink the water, toilet water we treated, right? So uh, we pay attention to the control of disinfection byproduct just as a precaution and trying to um, reduce uh, the amount of this, this compound entering the environment. So um, uh, they, nobody asked us to do that, but we just took it as a precaution. So that would be the primary, if there's any concern, that would be the primary concern. Uh, but I think we already noticed that and we are working on that. Yeah. The, um, in a similar sense, um, the electrodes that you've created for the algal blooms are really interesting. What a great idea. Um, and so I was very curious, I had a lot of questions, but the how, um, so to how efficient is it? So how do you, um, do you, you must calculate what you need. Let's say you have a pond of a cert, certain size. I mean, what is your efficiency? Do you think um, if you really wanted to go in and clean up a pond with a, a boat like that? And um, as you do that, what did come to mind was, um, so you, you did talk about the byproducts, but are you also de naturing the um, toxin as well as uh, stopping the chain of production of algae by killing the algal cells. So that was the question I had. And then also what else is coming through and being um, potentially killed? So the negative side of that, how do you deal with all the other plankton and zooplankton and things in the water that you don't want to kill? Yeah, so this technology was developed to, as an emerging response. So if you have a, um, have a heavy dense, uh, a very dense alga bloom at, at a near shore area, at a relatively small area, then we can use this technology. And so far we are, for the field testing we're doing, we just put our focus on, you know, the change of water quality between in effluent and influent. So the system per itself. Uh, the system per, uh, performance itself, um, rather than focusing on the improvement of the overall lake quality. So that it, it is a little bit frustrated that the lake didn't change much <laughs> before and after we come. So um, this is because of the treatment volume. So uh, algal bloom is such a big challenge because all of a sudden, um, the whole lake gets contaminated. So it is very difficult for us to, um, using pure engineering treatment process to mitigate the bloom in, uh, in, in lake area, right, for example. So that's, that's impossible. So for our technology, our technology was developed to mitigate bloom and near shore area or a small pound. And so far, the treatment capacity I mentioned is about 100 cubic meter per day. So it is still not enough. So we are, we are developing a, a system at a larger treatment volume. So for example, we are developing a, developing a module that can treat water at a flow rate of 100 gallon per minute. In this case, we are confident that we can mitigate the offshore hmm, small area uh, algal boom. But I believe that if we want to really control the, the hab in the lake size, we need to include other mitigation solutions. For example, the control of non-nitrogen and phosphate input. Yeah. Um, one question came in asking, um, from the perspective of an area like Nantucket, where we have a um, shellfish industry and uh, farming, you know, aquaculture, um, and we do have a lot of larvae in the water as well as um, shellfish, bivalves, living. Uh, how, how, do, how would you envision um, this sort of technology um, being helpful? And do you think there would be some side effects that you'd have to tweak to have it be useful? I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. So a lot of concern when we propose this idea. So what will we kill fish or will we kill other organisms? So I'm confident that any, for any a creature larger than the pore size, it won't get killed. <laughs> so, um, uh, but unfortunately for, for creatures 
uh, microorganism of uh, uh, zooplankton, uh, phytoplankton that can pass through the pores, they get killed, accompanied with the algae. So, and these are, uh, it is a one-way trip for them as well. So, um, therefore, my, our, our uh, purpose is that, okay, if you have a heavy, uh, if, if you have a heavy algal bloom, that, so the bloom is already there, other, other species is already dying or, or have already died, then we can use this technique to, to you know, um, to mitigate the bloom. Um, but I'm, uh, when we mitigate the bloom, we kind of, it's a nuclear bond solution, okay? So everything gone. Um, uh, so therefore, we, we, we want to deploy this technique, te technology to the, to the area that is already heavily impacted by the bloom. So with the bloom here, no, no, nothing else can grow. So therefore, we come to help. Yeah. And if you have a lot of biomass like that, a really thick bloom, um, do you generate a lot of byproducts that you then have to deal with as well? Is it, I would expect that that would also increase? So if there's a really heavy um, biomass that it's visible and it's floating on the water, we are also developing a process, physical, physical separation process to separate most of them first. And then we treat those uh, well dispersed, uh, cannot be separated portion in water. So as for the byproduct problem, I, I already show uh, in, the, in the figure, it is possible by adjusting the operational parameters to, uh, to avoid the excessive formation of byproduct. So uh, we are using the EPA regulation. Uh, as long as the DVP is lower than the, than the guideline, than the regulatory value, I think this, is, this will be a green light. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, the PFAS uh, work is really interesting too. And um, you know, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. Um, we, for a lot of people here that um, are concerned about their well water because of contamination from basically from um, flame retardant um, use, I think years of that. Um, I mean, what is interesting about your efforts is that if you have an area where it's hopefully not a continuous um, source that's contaminating, you can actually clean up a space using this, um, but I, that, do you have any particular challenges or comments on, the, um, on that work? So um, the project we, the, the, the PFAS project uh, we have performed is actually aiming at the remediation of contaminated groundwater. For example, groundwater in the Air Force contaminated by AFFF. Um, so that's the thing uh, that, that a lot, um, high, relatively high concentration of PFAS in, in, ground, in um, groundwater with a lot of organic matrix uh, matrix organics, so that's the tar that's the market we are targeting at. But for household well water, um, this would be a portable a use, right? So portable usage. I don't recommend to use any electrochemical oxidation or any reaction related to chemical reaction. You should just use activated carbon or other absorption process to make sure that you can physically separate them without formation of other products, right? So, um, yeah, that, that would be my answer. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. That's, um... And it's also e more economic. So uh, absorption is always um, um, a, a ch affordable than other, you know, chemical reaction. Yeah. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, even if you can filter it out of your water using um, absorption techniques, um, but the thought that somebody like like your lab, like you guys, um, are actually working on things where the, what has been absorbed can actually be broken down and remediated is a very reassuring thing to think about, in particular this year where we've had such a tough year. Um, to hear that some of these forever chemicals uh, won't be if, if people can engineer them into something else. And um, that's really exciting and it's really good news. So um, 
thank you so much. I, I um, could probably keep asking questions, but um, you've been so generous with your time and I really thank you for that. And maybe um, you can come back and give a talk in person to us on this little island of Nantucket, which would be um, really great. And if you wanted to prototype something, hmm. um, we uh we have both ponds and and shoreline um open you know we're surrounded by the ocean so it's plenty of testing sites here um and hopefully we won't have as many um algal blooms to deal with but uh yeah. but we have had them in in some of our ponds uh this summer so it's uh, definitely something we contend with here and once again, I thank you very much. Uh, it's really impressive work and interesting. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm lo I look forward to uh, visit Boston as well. Excellent. <laughs> thank you. So uh, have a good weekend.